Welcome to the Spectre Creative Channel. My name is Scott Toy Guru Nightlick, and I am a veteran of the toy industry for between 20 and 25 years, depending on uh, how I do my math. I have done a lot of amazing toys over the years, and I've had a lot of insights into the toy industry, and that's what this channel is all about. And today I want to talk about one of the more important insights, and that is how the toy industry is composed. You've got your suits, and you've got your Geppettos. And it tends to be that there are fewer and fewer Geppettos working on toys. And, well, a trend that I have unfortunately seen, especially in the last 10, 15 years, is that more and more toys, and even content, meaning movies, are designed by spreadsheets. They're designed to check off boxes. And the two examples I want to talk about that have cast a very long shadow over this is, well, first, Hunger Games, and specifically Katniss Everdeen. And the second one is BB-8. Not, not that BB-8. BB-8. This one, the droid. BB-8. Now, both BB-8 and Katniss have had some really cool toys. And they are very toyetic. They totally work for toys. They're awesome. And this is definitely not a video sort of, uh, you know, playing down either one of these characters. I own several Katniss toys, and I own one or two BB-8 toys. So why am I talking about these two characters in particular, picking them out amongst all of pop culture? Well, these two characters have done what I call casting a long shadow across the toy industry and the movie industry. For those of you not familiar with the concept of a long shadow, it's a term that refers to a character or even a particular story that affects things for a long time, that, that keeps things the way they are, uh, unchanging for a long, long time. A good example I like to use to illustrate this is back in the 1940s, the Sherlock Holmes movies with Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, now Joe Bruce here being the one who played Watson, Nigel played Watson as kind of a goof, as kind of a... I mean, he, he wasn't playing him dumb, he was just playing him, you know, more as the comedy relief, as kind of like a, a slapsticky, goofy character. And this projected a very long shadow over Watson, in particular, and a lot of people in culture grew up thinking Watson was goofy, when he's not. He is a very smart character. I mean, unless, of course, you know, you're specifically trying to make a comedy about Sherlock Holmes and Watson. But if you're not doing that, Watson is not the goofy character that Nigel Bruce made him out to be. So with that concept of, of how one character can cast a long shadow over pop culture, how does that apply to BB-8 and Katniss? Well, both characters were ones who really shook up the toy industry. Let's look at BB-8 first. BB-8 first came out in Episode 7 of Force Awakens, right? We're all aware of that. And there were a lot of BB-8 toys that came out with this. I mean, not an overkill like maybe with Baby Yoda, where there's, I would almost say, too many but you could get BB-8 in plush, in action figure, in different scales, in pocket size, in shelf size. There were a lot of BB-8 toys. And I wanted to talk in particular about the remote control BB-8. Not this one, this one, the Sphero one. So of all the toys that came out for BB-8, and even for Episode 7 in general, this was the one toy that really stole the public's heart. It was amazing. It was. It really was a great toy. Essentially, for those of you who are not aware of it, it was a remote control with your smartphone, and it would roll just like BB-8. And the uh, little head, you know, could move would, would move around while the ball was rolling. It wouldn't fall off. And, you know, it, it was a lot of fun. You could control it, make it do all sorts of things. It was a really fun toy. It was made by a company called Sphero, that had already had this toy at market, the rolling ball toy that could be remote controlled. And it did very well for them, but it didn't really break through. And they tried a lot of different versions. They tried light up versions. They tried versions that you could uh, maneuver through different obstacles. They sort of kept putting it out over and over again in what I would call different shells, you know, different colors with different you know, character faces. And it took until they put the literally BB-8 shell on top of it, that it became a cultural breakthrough. The mechanism they created was really groundbreaking. In fact, they're the ones who designed the actual BB-8 model for the movie and, you know, for live action and the actual, you know, model model. 
So when he came out on stage at Star Wars Celebration, people were really wowed because this was not CGI. This was a real thing. And you could now own this and manipulate it with your smartphone just like you moved in the movie. Now, this ties into what I call splicing. And if you haven't seen my video on splicing, I definitely recommend you check it out. What splicing is, is when the same toy license is given to multiple toy manufacturers, but with different parameters, scale, etc. So as an example, Jack Specific had this scale for BB-8, which was pretty close to a life-size one. I actually worked on this toy. I was really proud of it. It did some really awesome things. It's part of our Big Fix line. And, you know, he, he had pop that arm, his head moved. He was basically the BB-8 that we promoted as your buddy. Like, he could go with kids on their outdoor backyard adventures. And now if you look over at Hasbro, Hasbro, who had more or less, not the master license, but, you know, a, historically a big chunk of the Star Wars license, they made a playset for Episode Eight that started off as BB-8, and then you opened him up, and it transformed into a hodgepodge of different environments from the Episode Eight movie. Now, this is what, well, what I call the Chewbacca defense. This does not make sense. Why in the world would a, they put out a playset that was a transforming BB-8 that started off as a BB-8 that was more or less life-size, like the Jack's toy, but opened up as a playset. And not only did they do this for the 3 and 3 fourth Star Wars scale and world, which is kind of the historic one, but they did the same exact thing for their Galactic Heroes line for play school, for the younger kids. A second BB-8 that transformed into a playset. So this is a perfect example because, while well, sure, yes, it's, playsets are great, especially for the younger kids, why did it need to become BB-8? And the reason is, if not obvious, this is not a toy created by Geppetto. This is one created by, by Spreadsheet. It's a workaround. It was working around the license agreement because they didn't have rights to make a BB-8 toy, but they could make a BB-8 toy that big if it was a playset. It's literally working around the license. And when that becomes the reason for making a toy, you have to kind of step back and say, what are we doing? Another example of BB-8's long shadow are things like this Rogue One Walker, which was also a toy that had a remote control that was your iPhone. Again, the Sphero worked great because that was really revolutionary. It was a ball that you could remote control that was now a character that was beloved. So the, the big uh, mover for Rogue One was that toy, same concept, but without the ball. Another example would be the DO $150 remote control that was put out for Episode Nine. So again, Hasbro's putting out a, a product that's uh, you know a small robot remote controlled by your phone, but in this case, no one knew if this character was going to be beloved or not. And uh, you know you could argue about how how much he's loved by fans, but does he deserve a hundred and fifty dollar remote control robot? It worked for BB-8, but because it was a really unique you know way the ball rolled and was remote. But for Dio. It's kind of an example of what the toy industry does of what I call copy, paste, merch, repeat. If something works in one year, let's do it again in another year, but in another color or with a different character, regardless of whether or not it's actually going to work because, well, I hate to say it, but the spreadsheet says so. And when you're making toys based on the spreadsheet, well, that's the issue. Let's look at another example. So... People look at Hollywood, and a lot of times they say they're out of ideas, especially when you look at the sheer number of remakes that have been coming out over the last you know, 30 years. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I want to look at Katniss Everdeen and The Hunger Games. Loved the books, except for like the last 30 pages of the last book, but that's not important right now. Katniss was a real breakout character in the movie. And no, I'm not going to go a whole thing about how The Hunger Games is actually just a remake of a Japanese film. That's a video for another time. What I'm really talking about is because Hunger Games made a lot of money and Katniss was a female, an empowered female, she became kind of the, she was put on a throne basically. And, you know, it's not like she brought archery into sci-fi and pop culture. I mean, there's been no shortage of characters with bows and arrows, men, women, you know, all sorts. Archers have been a big part of popular culture and heroes, you know, going back to Robin Hood. 
And it's not like she was the first aspirational warrior woman. There have been really amazing aspirational female characters that were, you know, warriors with weapons, be it a gun or a bow and arrow or, you know, whatnot, you know, going back 30, 40 years. And by aspirational women, I'm not talking about things like, you know, Julia Roberts as Erin Brockovich, Brockovich. I mean, yes, aspirational, you know, for her mind and, you know, being a lawyer, but I, I mean more like warrior women is what I'm really talking about. And Katniss really brought this trend back, like you have with, uh, you know, Linda Carter here and Carrie Fisher as Princess Leia, also another kind of warrior woman. Fast forwarding to today, and compared to the number of warrior women we've had in the last 40 years, look at how many we've had in the last, like, five years. This has just exploded, and it kind of all goes back to Katniss. Katniss worked, so let's do it again with every property. Let's make, oh, I don't know, the Ghostbusters females, because Katniss worked. Let's make Star Wars full of females, because Katniss worked. And in fact, Star Wars tried this whole female thing, not just once, but they kept kind of trying it over and over and over again in each movie, trying to create a aspirational female warrior character. Heck, they even made the one in the last movie, an archer. And this is because of Katniss. This is the long shadow of Katniss, as I said in the beginning of this video. Star Wars in fact, already has some amazing female characters. And that's kind of the thing. They didn't need to create brand new ones. To me, they should have just banked on the ones they already have. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, some of the female characters from Mandalorian, be it Ahsoka or, you know, a Space Marshal Dune here, gets their own series because they're really great female characters and they're not created by spreadsheets. They just were created organically, which is how characters should be. I think the best example really is almost in the... Uh, Endgame Avengers movie, that one scene, you all know what I'm talking about, when all the female characters gather together and charge Thanos, because, you know, no men in this shot, we can't have any men charging Thanos, it's only women, you know, if you have, if you're a man, get away. That shot felt so artificial, and toy lines, almost like, like this one, also feel a little artificial. There's a reason that Captain Marvel toys didn't sell. When a character is created because it's reflecting a trend, i.e. Katniss as aspirational warrior female that made a lot of money at the box office, she was organic. But when you're trying to copy a trend and just do it over and over again because it worked once, well, with Captain Marvel, I was actually told by an executive that this movie and toy line was literally designed by a spreadsheet, down to the fact that it was released on you know, National Women's Day. It was meant to, it was designed to be an empowering movie for women. And maybe it absolutely reached some girls and women, but looking at the toy sales in the box office, maybe, you know, it didn't quite meet those expectations. And that all goes back to what I said in the beginning. I have noticed, being in the toy industry, how much spreadsheets are now relied on for creations of characters and creation of content. And doing this is not going to lead to success because you're, you're, you're copying trends, you're taking one thing that cast a long shadow over the industry and doing it again. For kids, when they watch movies, they need to get emotionally invested in them. And only organically created characters can do this. And when kids love the content, they will then buy and love the toys. And that's where it all comes together. Because creating toys that children get emotionally connected to comes from the content and comes from making toys with actual play patterns, the way children play, not by just copying trends. And that's what brings me back to Spectra Creative, my consulting firm. What we specialize is helping companies understand that emotional need between child and toy product, it literally to help develop better movies, better toy product that are going to sell better and make more children happy. If you like this video and you'd like to see more videos like this, do subscribe. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions. Give it a like and that uh, helps YouTube share it with more people because it tells YouTube that you know it's popular. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.